One quick note before we dive in today. We had a few gremlins in the proverbial machine during this recording. As a result, you may notice a little bit of strangeness with the microphones in this episode, especially my own. However, we managed to keep those audio shenanigans to a minimum. We hope you enjoy the show. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. We're diving deep today in uh, what will come to be the first terrible pun of this episode uh, into a story that some people may remember, right, as one of those many ephemeral headlines that circulated in 2000 and 2001. Uh, but this was brought to our attention by, uh, by one of our fellow listeners, a fellow conspiracy realist, who uh, for the sake of comic book nerdery, we will refer to as Neymar. Hey guys. So I just got out of the Navy uh, working on submarines, and as such, I've got a couple submarine conspiracies that you may or may not know about. So the first one is the Kursk, which that made international news in 2000, I think it was 2000, uh, the Russian submarine that was spying on uh, United States and, and, and NATO submarines and, and warships doing, doing a, bunch of, a bunch of exercises, and it blew up. The official story is that a torpedo blew up, uh, but I know people who have been, who are on uh, the boat, one of the submarines, and they they were listening to the Kursk, and I know one of them has told me it definitely got shot uh, by another boat. One said it definitely did not, and and some of the others have have refused to talk about it. So so who knows what's going on there? That one's definitely worth looking into. Namor, this is a fantastic question, and you've actually you, you've given us a lot to chew on here, such that we talked off air, and this may be the first of multiple submarine-related conspiracies, because let's talk about submarines. The weirdest thing about a submarine is that they are inherently conspiratorial. There are these mysterious, at times nuclear-powered craft that are, as we record, sneaking through the ocean depths across the planet. You know, a, a submarine is explicitly designed to deceive, to occlude its presence. The location and the capabilities of a submarine are often the stuff its owners don't want you to know. And so it's no surprise that submarines are themselves the subject of numerous conspiracies. So today we're diving into the mystery of one submarine in particular. As you requested, Namor, what happened to the Kursk? Here are the facts. So work on the K-141 Kursk began in 1990, um, and the sub uh, officially launched in 1994. And it was massive. Uh, It was a massive deal. (laughs) But it was also physically massive at 508 feet, 19,400 tons. Um, It was capable of launching missiles the size of a small aircraft that would absolutely uh, decimate any targets that were unfortunate enough to be in its path. And that uh, could be up to 400 miles away. NATO actually called it an Oscar II class, uh, which is a nuclear powered cruise missile submarine owned and operated by the Russian Navy. And until 2007, uh, conversion of the U.S. Navy's Ohio class subs from ballistic missiles to these types of more uh, long range cruise missiles. Um, the Oscar II class submarines were the largest of their type in the world. And this particular Oscar II class submarine, the Kursk, was a big deal. It and others in this class were explicitly designed 
to defeat the biggest threats that were seen in the U.S. Navy's command, the U.S. Aircraft Carrier Group. So the machines that are out there floating that function as a full military command base and airport. Yeah, it's important to remember that until about 2007, the Oscar II class was the largest type a submarine of its type in the entire world. The only reason that changed is because the Ohio, some Ohio class subs that originally launched ballistic missiles were converted to also launch cruise missiles. The Kursk had the power, in theory, to sink an aircraft carrier with a single torpedo that was specifically something called a Type 65. These torpedoes carried a 990-pound warhead. This is this is serious stuff. And, you know, to be very clear, uh, when we say aircraft carrier in this sense, we mean exactly what Matt is talking about here. The the ship that is the, uh, the carrier, where you see the jets launching and stuff. Aircraft carriers don't ride solo. They roll deep. Uh, the, you'll... We have to remember that an aircraft carrier is one part of what is it called an aircraft carrier battle group, and that includes other ships. It changes depending on the mission, but, you know, it includes things like guided missile cruisers, destroyers, uh, frigates like this. This is not the only thing on the album. An aircraft carrier battle group is kind of like a posse track, but the aircraft carrier is the, you know, is the Tupac. uh, Ben, really quickly. Yeah. What is a frigate? Yeah, yeah, frigate is a, is an old term. I love so many maritime terms. There's also like brigantine. Uh, a, a frigate is meant to uh, protect other warships, and some. And I think they specialize. Now, again, I'm not a member of the navy, but I think they specialize in uh, anti-submarine warfare pretty often. I just every time I hear, I just want to say friggin' frigate. You know, it's just got it's got the ring to it. But please let us right the ship and move forward in the episode. There we go, there we go. The the uh, so aside from being powerful in offensive terms, the Kursk was also uh, very. Uh, it was a source of pride for the Russian military because it its structure was purportedly incredibly robust and sturdy in a way that uh, would worry the members of NATO. Yes, the the whole design of this craft made it very, very, at least on paper, difficult to sink, to breach the hull, to, to cause major damage to this thing. It had a double hold design, so... Just think about it this way. On the outer, the exoskeleton, essentially, the outer hull was stainless steel. It had uh, all kinds of different metals in there, nickel, chromium, and um, it had extremely good resistance to things like corrosion and natural processes that would weaken the whole system. And something that's really interesting, these metals actually have a bit of a weak magneticism to them. And something really interesting about these metals, nickel and chromium, and uh, you know, combined there with steel, both of these metals were very difficult to detect with this thing that the United States military was using, a magnetic anomaly detector. Uh, And because those metals have those weak signals, as it's traveling through the sea, through the ocean, uh, it's not as easily detected because of that weak signature those metals contain. And, you know, then you get into the inner hole and you're looking at two inch thick steel. It's, It's really cool because the the structure of that outer and inner hole essentially made this thing so strong that you could just plow through ice out in the Arctic somewhere if you needed to, just to break through. And the way this structure, I mean, already we're, we're kind of describing here just how strong this thing is, right? Uh, it was compared a lot to the Titanic, at least in some of the, the writing that, that I saw about the ship or the boat, excuse me, the submarine because it was built with these compartments, separate, separated compartments, that if one were to be breached and a flood was to occur in one of those, you could turn, you could shut that thing down, lock it off, and then be safe in another compartment. Even if the submarine were to sink all the way down to the, the ocean floor, the crew would theoretically be able to survive in one of those other compartments if they did 
you know, sealed themselves in essentially and had enough oxygen. But that comparison to the Titanic about being unsinkable and that structure is very interesting. Yeah, I don't know if it's our own kind of personal selection bias or something, but it seems like historically, whenever we run into uh, these so-called indestructible or impregnable structures, something goes terribly awry. It's like putting a, a target on your inventions back. This boat was able to do something amazing and possibly something that would terrify some of our landlubbers in the audience, the Kursk was able to remain submerged for up to 120 days. That means if you were on the crew of the Kursk, it was theoretically possible that you would sink under the surface of the briny blue and you would not see the sun or see the sky until almost half a year had passed. I just have to say, I have no military experience, but the concept of doing that for 120 days straight, um, psychologically, I would not want to be in there trapped with, what, 100, maybe 100 plus human beings inside that thing? No, thank you. I can't even imagine just the logistics of that and just like the sanitary conditions. You know what I mean? I'm sure, you know, there's there's things to help keep things from becoming from deteriorating into a state of, you know, uh, disgustingness, I guess, for lack of a better word. But um, it seems like it'd be pretty stinky down there with all those men's, you know, bodies. Yeah, that's what's that. That's one of the first things I thought of, too, because we have we have amazing technology for, you know, um, recycling air we have a, amazing water reclamation technology as a species, but for some reason, our entire species just hasn't figured out a way to get around the funk, you know, just that locker room stank with an A that occurs whenever you have a, a bunch of a, a bunch of people in a small claustrophobic situation. And you know, we're not. We want to be completely fair. Like the curse was large enough and to a degree opulent enough that senior uh, senior officers did have their own staterooms. It's not like everybody was three people to a bunk or something, but still life on a submarine is, is very, very challenging. And the Kursk itself actually only completed a single mission during its time, which sounds unusual for such a, um, such a juggernaut of the waves. During five years of service, it completed one six-month deployment to the Mediterranean Sea. This was in 1999, and they were going to monitor U.S. naval response to the Kosovo crisis that was occurring. Now, you might ask yourself, why spend so much time, blood, and treasure on the creation of uh, a, a craft like this and not really take it out, you know, not really give it a spin around the global block? It turns out uh, there were, I don't know if it's fair to say Russia was broke, but they had some serious money issues going on, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so they, they spent all this money, you know, top dollar to make this impregnable, uh, you know, behemoth of a, of a seafaring war machine. Um, and they didn't factor in a little, uh, detail, you know, the, the, the go-go juice, the stuff that makes it go, literally the fuel. They didn't have it and built it into the budget. Um, there was an absolute funding crisis that was, uh, so serious that many members of the Northern fleet had gone unpaid uh, for quite a while in the mid-90s. Imagine that. Okay, so now let's paint the situation uh, <laughs> with a little bit of a sharper brush to your point, Noel. You're trapped on a submarine. You might be underwater for four months. Everything stinks of funk and sweat. Uh, and the other hundred-something people with you are non-consensual volunteers, right? They signed up for the Navy with the expectation that they would be paid for it. And all of a sudden, you're not getting the checks. And that doesn't mean you can get off the boat. You're still stuck. <laughs> ah, it's terrible. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be glib about it because the story of the Kursk uh, takes, a, takes a, a very violent turn uh, almost 20 years ago today. Yes. So on August 10th, in the year 2000, well, something strange happened. 
there was an unexpected disaster, at least according to the official story, right? There's an unofficial disaster that occurs during an exercise um, out at sea. It was called Summer X, and the way the story goes, there was a tremendous explosion inside of the submarine itself that ended up just tearing the thing into several pieces, specifically the front end, the nose of it was completely ripped off of the submarine itself. And there were other uh, pretty large parts of this submarine that were completely separated and blown apart and shoved into one another. And again, this is a submarine. You have to remember it is operating underneath the surface of the water. So unless you are specifically tracking this thing with some kind of sophisticated high-powered radar or some other technology, you don't know where it is if you're on the surface. Let's say even if you're in a frigate or another ship or something that's monitoring the situation, you don't know exactly where they are. But there were crews on surrounding ships or nearby ships, and the only way that they knew something had gone wrong was that they felt the impact or in essentially the boom, the implosion that occurred below and they, they, you could feel it, essentially, being on another craft. This disaster occurred in an area known as the Barents Sea. Uh, the Barents Sea is a part of the Arctic Ocean. It's off the northern coast of Norway and Russia. Uh, and this, this geography is important because that second, much larger explosion created an impact that could be felt as far away as Alaska. Later research by seismologists would conclude that this was the, the force was equivalent to that of an earthquake measuring 4.2 on the Richter scale, which means that, uh, which of course would lead you to, to rightly assume that munitions were part of the explosion. You know what I mean? Not just a fire or something. Yes, and it follows that uh, there were no survivors. All 118 members of the crew of the Kursk uh, perished in the disaster. Um, and, you know, this was something that Vladimir Putin, who was recently elected at the time, it's hard to imagine a time when Vladimir Putin wasn't the head of this part of the world. Uh, but there, there certainly was, and he had recently been elected and staked a lot of his reputation on pushing for this project. So this was a big blow uh, to to him personally. Um, and it wasn't a good look either that he happened to be on vacation at the time. Um, and this did not play well with relatives of the crew members. I watched a documentary about this, and there, there were a lot of, um, I guess, hearings where relatives of the crew members were just shrieking uh, in, in Russian and just at the top of their lungs cursing Putin and this regime um, and saying, how could you let these men live in a tiny box for, you know, however long uh, we, we know it was it was quite a long time with no pay. We know that happened, too. And then just, you know, let them die like dogs, basically, you know, so a lot of emotion. Um, they were absolutely aghast and enraged at the way this disaster was handled. Uh, they argued that the official statements were absolute uh, disinformation, absolute BS. Um, was there a cover up? We'll talk about that after a quick word from our sponsor. Let's walk through the immediate aftermath of this disaster. And, you know, it, it's tempting to say that, of course, uh, anyone will react uh, with intense grief and emotion when they lose a loved one. But it's, it's crucial for us to emphasize that the claims of the relatives of these crew members were not just made up out of whole cloth. They didn't just wake up for no reason and, de and decide to accuse the government of deceiving them. Later research found that there were intense problems with the investigation. The Russian Navy, according to official sources, initially did not realize an accident had occurred more than six hours passed before a, an initial search even began. And to your point about those compartments, Matt, 
does that mean like you can look at layouts of the of the these nine compartments in the Kursk? Does that mean that some of the 118 people aboard were able to escape whatever that initial blast was and move to a safer compartment? Would six hours have saved them? You know, 11 hours later, the Navy declared an emergency. Finally, Uh, later research showed uh, that all crew members had died by that point. Normally, there's a, you know, cache of safety gear um, on these types of subs, rescue buoys, um, which automatically deploy sort of like an escape pod in a spaceship or something. Uh, But that did not occur. The buoy of the Kursk had been disabled. It took the Navy 16 hours to find the the wreckage and and to, to start to kind of like figure out what had happened. Um, rumors were circulating the sub may have collided with a, f- a mine, which we know exists. We know there's like, you know, still potentially, a- isn't there one in Savannah, Ben? Didn't we talk about that? In Savannah, Georgia, there's a mine somewhere out there in the in the harbor. It's a nuclear, uh, nuclear weapon. Oh, even worse. But still, we have heard tell of still active mines out there, you know, from, from war. Uh, and this was a, uh, again, a rumor, but that it had been an undeployed mine, um, that it collided with, uh, inadvertently. Yeah. From way back in world war two, uh, there are, you know, there are all kinds of rumors that were circulating around at the time. It, it, it's, it makes total sense, right? How on earth could this have happened? We were doing some kind of official exercise. Nothing could have, should have gone wrong. Maybe there was a friendly fire situation, an accidental, you know, deployment of a torpedo that ended up hitting a friendly target in this way. Right. If you're if you're imagining yourself as as the Russian military or or some of the um, the commanders there. And the thing is, there's all kinds of other stuff that people have said over the years about what may have happened. But now almost 20 years, almost 20 years to the day later. The question still remains, what actually happened inside that submarine and to that submarine on that day, August 10th, 2000? Here's where it gets crazy. The official explanation, even at first, was was suspicious. There were problems that cropped up with it immediately. The primary issue was the high amount of secrecy involved. The Russian government refused all international offers of assistance, which can, you know, if you're suspicious, it can function as tacit confirmation that they had perhaps some secret technology on there or something that they were not uh, comfortable with other nations discovering. These things went back and forth. So we're going to jump around in time just a little bit. Uh, right now, the official explanation is uh, that the authorities say the crew of the curse was preparing to load a dummy torpedo, a practice torpedo, right? Because these are naval exercises. That doesn't mean it's it's actual war. So they don't want to shoot, you know, genuine torpedoes. And this torpedo that they were loading, which was a 6576 kit torpedo, had two problems. First, it contained a liquid called high-test peroxide. This is not the kind of stuff that you put in your hair when you're a teenager or something. Uh, Second problem, they claimed there was a manufacturing defect and that there was a faulty weld in the casing of of the torpedo. And so when the when they were loading this on, this high-test peroxide, or HTP, leaked from this faulty weld, and it caused the torpedo's fuel to explode. That fuel is kerosene, right? And kerosene is a friend of explosions. And remember, by the way, this is a 65-type weapon. That's the aircraft carrier killer that we were talking about, a very large weapon, uh, or a very large a piece of ammunition, uh, I don't know what you call it, a round, if you will. Um, so, so when the explosion occurred, mixed with the things we're talking about there, the kerosene and the high, the HTP, it blew off the inner and outer doors to the torpedo. So, the things that are really helping in a lot of ways to keep the water out, which is you know generally a good thing when you're inside a metal container inside the ocean. 
Um, then it started a fire. It destroyed the bulkhead, the separator essentially between the first and second compartments, like the ones we were talking about there, where uh, the control room, by the way, was in one of those. So when that bulkhead was destroyed between the first and second compartments and that fire's going, you actually had probably, at least in all likelihood, most, if not all of the crew within the control room, the people running the boat, running the sub, they probably all perished or at least were badly injured and perished soon after that. Really, really messed up. And then we have that second explosion that was noticed by a lot of the crew that was on the surface. And that really is an issue when you don't have access to controls of a ship that you are on or a boat. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. And, and this, uh, we know that that initial blast occurs, right? The, the theory is, or the official explanation is the way that you just outlined it, Matt. And the idea is that two minutes and 15 seconds ballpark after that initial blast, the submarine, the Kursk had reached the floor of the sea and this, the intensity of this initial fire eventually triggered the detonation of multiple torpedo warheads on board. It is impossible in the English language to accurately describe how terrible that is. Because remember, earlier in the episode, just for an example, we pointed out that these warheads could weigh 990 pounds. This is calamitous. That second explosion was the equivalent of over uh, two tons of TNT. But as we said, there were people who had a lot of problems with this explanation. No, no doubt. The torpedo manufacturer uh, themselves completely contested this version of events. Um, in addition to that, the official story seemed to contradict Russia's own claims about the hull of the craft. Uh, it seemed completely inconceivable that that double hull design uh, with those nine watertight compartments, um, which are obviously meant to fill up in the event of, of a breach um, to keep it from completely being compromised, that it would have taken just the absolute most violent explosion to pierce uh, those very, very um, uh, fortified watertight compartments. Um, so let's go into some of the possibilities. We start off with maybe the most plausible, like using kind of process of elimination and just uh, common sense. At the time, senior officers in the Russian Navy claimed that the Kursk had collided with a British or American sub that was running spying maneuvers um, out in the Barents Sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, so this is interesting, Neymar, because what we see here is that both quote-unquote sides of the militaries involved are accusing the other ones of spying. So our U.S. position is the Kursk was said they were doing exercises, but the real goal was, or at least one of the goals was to spy on the U.S., right, and, and detect our maritime presence. That makes total sense. I'm not saying that's untrue. It probably is because military exercises or war games or whatever you want to call them are often, they often have multiple ulterior motives, right? Let's show an antagonistic force uh, that we can, um, like China a few years back, let's show the U.S. that we can also shoot satellites out of the sky, and let's let's call that let's let's call that a test for the environment or whatever they said. That was hilarious. Maybe I'm being a jerk. I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, just speaking of in part of another bit of submarine research that we were doing together, we we heard and I'm going to quote this. It's from PBS's Nova. They discussed how way back when in the 1960s and 70s. The United States militaries, specifically the Navy, working with several others, they miked the entire ocean, or almost the entire ocean. And this is this is something that we are probably going to do an entire episode on if we haven't done it already, which maybe we have. I don't think we have. But there were microphones everywhere. As an audio nerd, the logistics of that alone is blowing my mind. I mean, miking up a drum kit is a pain in the butt. You know, can you imagine miking the entire ocean? Uh, any audio files or studio rats out there know what we're talking about. Well, it's, 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 I guess, less sophisticated than you may imagine. 
uh, it's more about uh, visual readouts, but it just knowing that the U.S. military was listening to everything to identify exactly where Russia was operating or at the time the Soviet Union, uh, just it's everybody's doing it. That's all. And again, no no shade here at all because we have to remember, you know, uh, everybody is trying to do this. The the U.S had satellites taking photographs before they could figure out a, a like a viable way to send those photographs back to Earth. They literally were, Paul beat me here, they were literally dropping film and shit from the sky and then sending some poor schmuck out to try to catch it. So like, yeah, everybody is, everybody is spying on each other in some way. And the, the reason we're bringing up this dichotomy is because the Russian claims are not that they were spying on U.S. or British craft. The Russian claims are that they were participating in these uh, naval exercises and they were being shadowed by those those dastardly uh, the ne'er do wells over at NATO, so they are they are saying that the West was spying on us. It seems like everybody was spying on each other. If you want to be completely fair, everybody was spying on each other because that's the right thing to do. But then, if that's the case, why wasn't there a quicker response to the disaster on the Kursk if it were indeed an accident? Sorry, no one could see this on the Zoom, but I just got so pleased with myself and like leaned back from the mic and looked at you guys. <laughs> we we were also all nodding pretty heavily. Uh, yeah, true. but but I, I love the 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 one upsmanship or brinksmanship. Maybe. Nah, we, we we went into that one the other day. But I think this is more one upsmanship. It's like you gonna spy on me, bro? Let me spy on you. Oh, you could spy on me. Well, I'm gonna double hard spy on you, bro. You know that's the I'm way. Gonna spy on the whole world. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna mic the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> so. The, the the thing about this is that everything we just said is true. None, none of this is none of this is conspiracy theory. You're gonna mic um, the ocean, bro. I'm gonna mic space. I'm sorry, yeah, right? I'm, done. I'm, done. I'm done. I'm done. No, no. What else can we mic? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, then we made smartphones. Now we have mics everywhere, right? Right, right. Uh, I always think of that thing in Batman uh, where they turn every smartphone in the world into a listening device. That is not beyond the realm of possibility uh, these days. Uh, it's it's pretty pretty terrifying. But total total aside, I think it's just a fun experiment, and I would love to hear you guys take on it. And I'd love to hear from our fellow conspiracy realists about this. Um, so it's no secret, you know, like the I'm not going to put any of us on the spot specifically, but I know between the three of us, we have a lot of like proxies and privacy things on our phones and on our devices. I wanted to do an experiment where I removed those, uh, you know, uh, what are ostensibly protections to see how the ad, uh, how the ad um, magic algorithms work. And I w I've been I've been trying to build an ad profile as like a deranged billionaire, so I, I'll be carrying my phone around, maybe open Facebook in an OS or something, and just be like mega yacht price price mega yacht <laughs> diamonds wholesale. Yes, Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton. <laughs> yes, whole you know. Yeah. <laughs> So if anybody wants to do an experiment with that and join us, we'd love to hear your results. So far, I have not been getting targeted ads for a mega yacht. So maybe I'm, I'm just not doing it right. Maybe, you know what? The system probably already knows that I can't actually buy it. I, I think mega yachts are the kind of things that don't really need to be advertised for. They just <laughs> kind of make them to order. <laughs> you know what I mean? True. <laughs> there's not, there's, there's probably not. Some uh, some guy at a department in IKEA going. How am I going to move all these mega yachts? People just keep wasting money on couches. But but anyway, yes, the spying stuff is real. Noel, to your point, um, this does seem like a plausible explanation, does it not? For for someone to say, for for members of the Russian Navy to say, the Kursk had collided with someone. That was spying on them. It has a propagandistic effect, too, because the implication here is that the other side is somehow incompetent uh, or or uh, culpable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, look, it was their fault. They shouldn't have been there in the first place. And they killed all our beloved comrades. It's a good way to spin it to maybe uh, redirect some of that anger. We're talking about about women, you know, wives who'd lost their husbands, etc. You know, mothers who'd lost their sons. Uh, let's let's uh, 
point this, you know, shotgun blast of, of grief and anxiety toward the enemy, or at least an other. And secrecy aside, well, actually, it's, it's all kind of secrecy from this point on. There are a lot of even more conspiratorial thoughts going into what actually occurred here to the Kursk. And we're going to talk about those after a quick word from our sponsor. Anybody down to talk secret torpedoes? Always. All, that's one of my main things. You know what I mean? It's like number number one on my LinkedIn is talk to me about secret torpedoes. I'm kidding. I, I, I haven't been on LinkedIn forever. I don't, I don't know what it says. It's true, though. There are secret. So more conspiratorial ideas. One of the one of the ones you'll see frequently is that the Russian government was being very secretive about the wreckage of the Kursk because they were carrying, like we had kind of uh, speculated earlier, they were carrying top secret technology, specifically a classified ultra high speed torpedo known as the Squall, or in Russian, S H K V A L. NATO at the time was very concerned about this. And so for some time, you would see speculation that maybe they were taking this off the drawing board and into action too soon, and something had gone wrong with this new technology. I mean, you know, it kind of logically makes sense, right? New technology is super treacherous. How many people died in a space program, right? How many people have died in experiments with new munitions, with new aircraft? You know what I mean? It's it's unfortunately it's a cost of doing the business that is war. But here's the problem. Um, there's a lot of speculation by, you know, military experts and historians that these uh, this technology never really existed. Um, so that's uh, puts a little bit of a wrench into this theory. Um, but but how would they know? It's well, hyper classified. It's hyper classified mega torpedoes. Um, it's true. I don't know. That's a, I know. I know you're joking there, Matt. But it's it's a good point you make. I mean, there really is no way of knowing if that level of secrecy that we know the Russians are capable of um, was 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 a thing. Uh, so let's talk. Let's 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 pivot away a little bit to the American side of things. You'll see some of these claims that the U.S. submarine, uh, the well, the a pair of submarines actually, the USS Memphis and the Toledo, uh, sank the Kursk with their torpedoes or. You know, which the official line of the Russian government is that they collided with them while they were out on those spying uh, expeditions or whatever you call it, kind of uh, exercises. Uh, and this theory goes like this. The Toledo accidentally collided with the Kursk. And so the Memphis then opened fire when uh, fearing retaliation and the resulting fire ignited the torpedoes. So kind of like... At a, at a party somewhere where things get out of hand, somebody bumps into someone and someone's like, hey, why'd you bump into me? And then someone else preemptively tries to end a fight by starting one. I, it's, it sounds strange, but it, it also, I don't know about you all, but it, it feels like it has the ring of plausibility to me because accidents do happen and people are already at such an enormously tense point here. Isn't that a weird escalation, though, Ben? I guess I guess that's to your point. The tension is is a big part of it because they shouldn't have been there in the first place, right? So it, it was almost like they were discovered, and then it's right. Or or, or are these are, are these international waters? No, right. The, this is definitely they're they're not supposed to be there. So if the Kursk discovers this American spying craft, it would be uh, it would be on the table for them to open fire anyway. I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. You know, that's a really good question, though, from the way the uh, from the way the situation's occurring, I imagine and listeners, please correct us here, but I, I imagine this is either uh, an international lane of traffic or or an international waters area, or maybe there are conflicting claims about the the sovereignty over the sea here because you know as we know uh you think land borders are messy ocean borders are hilarious they're 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 a pile of dangerous spaghetti that people get killed over yeah man you can't build an ocean wall right 
I mean, not yet. I yeah. guess you could maybe, but it'd be pretty expensive and pretty messy. We, you know, we were really focused on the microphones for a while. Uh, we we haven't upgraded to the wall yet, but we'll get there. I, so so it, it feels realistic, but it also feels maybe a little bit too convenient. The problem is that, of course, these uh, these lines of speculation thrive because of the secrecy immediately following the disaster and the years following that. But let's get really conspiratorial here. We can start connecting odd dots. According to the stories, one of the U.S. submarines in the area had its emergency buoy deployed. Like we said earlier, an emergency buoy is an automatic thing that happens as a means of assisting search and rescue efforts. It only deploys generally in an emergency. The Russian Kursk buoy, as I think you had said earlier, Matt, was disabled. And the U.S. buoy that deployed was apparently recovered by Russian forces. One of the subs, the Memphis, went to port to get repairs in Norway. So there was some kind of damage to it. The implication is. Uh, and you'll see people claiming that there is photographic evidence of the USS Memphis and that the, these photos show the hatch covering this emergency buoy is missing. So you start to see kind of the uh, the threads connecting here. But that's, that's only part of the story. There's other speculation about the USS Toledo. Yeah, so supposedly after this event went down, the the Toledo itself needs to get some repairs, so it heads on over uh, to a facility within the U.S., and once it gets in there, absolutely no one is allowed to see it. The personnel that generally would be doing those repairs and inspecting it, making sure everything's okay, taking reports on that, they just don't get to look at it. And then, check this out. There's supposedly video evidence from the Kursk that shows several large gashes on the hull, or, you know, a lot of damage on the hull that's fairly long, and it seems to show that the metal is bent inward, as though there was an explosive force on the outside pushing that metal in. Now, what we do need to take into account here is the uh, concept of implosion, when you've got a pressurized container, right? That then when there's a ton of, in this case, ocean water pressure on the outside and the exterior of that, let's say just a can, a big aluminum can, if there's an, if there's sufficient pressure on the outside, then an implosion can occur where there would be, uh, essentially a, a crushing of that container and the explosion would cause it to look a very certain way. And a lot of times, if that pressure is large enough, you would just see fragments of metal as like, that's what is left over. That is not what happened with the Kursk, for sure, at least uh, a full implosion, because it wasn't at full depth there when it occurred, where, or, uh, you know, 15,000, I think, feet would be around the time when you get like full crushing depth. Right, and the, the Kursk was at 354 feet under the surface, or 108 meters. Right, which is nothing compared to, you know, crushing depth or, or deeper depths. So, we're you know, implosion, I don't know. I, all I'm saying is uh, it, it still feels a little fishy, uh, but it doesn't <laughs> necessarily prove anything. Oh, fishy, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's true, but there's there's another there's an even weirder series of rumors about stuff that happened on land after this, right? Yes, and this is even fishier, almost to me. Um, it's this the story goes that uh, almost immediately after this incident, a quite sizable uh, loan or debt uh, to the United States. Uh, on Russia's behalf um, was forgiven and Russia was allowed to take out an additional loan. That doesn't happen. You know, we don't, well, to, to what end? What, what's the reasoning there? Uh, very unusual. Also in the days after the incident, it turns out that George Tennant 
went to Moscow. If you don't, that name doesn't ring a bell. He was the first acting CIA director in history to go to the Russian capital, which is a big deal. Um, and that last part is definitely true. Uh, but it's also important to, to this. There's no causation here. Uh, these events are not necessarily connected, uh, but it sure does make you think, doesn't it, fellas? Yeah, this is this is kind of the juicy stuff, right? Uh, because uh, George Tenet did travel uh, to Moscow just eight days later on August 18th. Uh, it was officially an invitation from Russian officials to discuss ways to counter international terrorism, uh, but the embassy refused to give any further details about this, and uh, Uncle Sam stonewalled the media pretty hardcore. So now, we, as we said, this happened almost 20 years ago to the day. We have the benefit of retrospect. We have a lot of other intervening research, and some of this later research has has uh, has drawn conclusions or gathered evidence that's just disappointing enough to maybe sound like the truth. So what if the Kursk wasn't using these secret high-tech, uh, what'd you call it, Matt, hyper-classified? It's been your yeah, favorite buddy. phrase. Yeah, these hyper-classified squall torpedoes. But what if instead, as a very cash-strapped Navy, they were relying on cheap, old-fashioned technology? Because, you know, that's another line item that you don't have to add to the budget. There's a former Royal Naval Engineering College lecturer named Maurice Stradling, and he's also a torpedo designer, which sounds like a really interesting hobby. It's probably a job, but it's a cool idea as a hobby. So he started comparing and contrasting stuff. He looked at the data from the Kursk disaster, and it reminded him of this pretty obscure story about a similar explosion aboard a British sub in 1955. I had never heard of this. I think most people in the U.S., aside from professional explosion investigators like Rachel Lance, have probably not heard of this. That's so amazing that you mentioned that, Ben. I, that's what I was scratching. My, I, was trying, like, I had a thought, and then it went away, and it was Rachel Lance. Man, uh, for people that, that maybe don't listen to the other show that Ben and I do, Ridiculous History, we interviewed Rachel Lance about the sinking of the SS, of, of the Hunley, excuse me, it's not the SS, which was like a World War I, uh, no, I'm sorry, a Civil War submarine that was made out of like, it's like a Flintstone sub where you have to crank it with your feet. And she is the foremost expert on underwater explosions, <laughs> which we joked was a very, very specific uh, 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 specialization. And she agreed. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear her take on this. Well, just, just to jump back to that. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm sorry that I missed that, guys. Uh, but the, the other disaster that we're talking about here where there was an explosion due to some kind of um, malfunctioning torpedo... Let's jump to uh, a boat called the Sidon, the S-I-D-O-N. There was some kind of experimental torpedo on board, and there was an explosion. Here's the deal, though. This torpedo contained the substance that's thought to have been within the Kursk, that HTP, or high-test peroxide. And the thought was the crew of the Sidon were loading this torpedo and that's when the explosion occurred. When this blast happened, 13 men died. So this is fascinating, and this is something we know, again, in retrospect. The, some of the official findings of this tragedy with the British sub uh, didn't match the actual findings carried out by that secret board of inquiry into the disaster. Uh, once this report was laid, later became public, they found that a stainless steel pipe carrying this high-test peroxide to the engine of the sub had burst. And something the public didn't know at the time, uh, the original investigation found incompetence on the part of the submarine crew, again, of this, of this UK uh, boat, the Sidon, the, they found that the torpedo had accidentally been started or ignited 
you know, before it was fired out of the sub, which is kind of like um, a, a, a really uh, – a really terrible comparison. Imagine uh, torpedoes at this time in the fifties, a little bit similar to firecrackers. Like you gotta you gotta ignite them and then shoot them. But you're in a sub. Remember, you you, you can't run away. So the timing is very very important. Uh, so the idea here is that there had been maybe a little bit of a um, a cover up, or at the least, public uh, you know public reputation management. Uh, on the part of the UK government. And importantly, to Stradling's point, the torpedoes on the Kursk also had HTP, leading Stradling to believe that this proves a similar disaster led to the destruction of this Russian submarine. So he is finding in favor of uh, an accident, you know, not, not a planned act of belligerence. And the explosion of this practice torpedo in the Kursk, he says, set off this chain reaction with the live warheads. And this caused the explosion that later sent the Kursk to its watery grave. And this is the exact story that if you go to the Moscow Times, uh, the independent news out of Russia, this is the exact story that they have uh, that was published in August of 2019 of what the true fate of the Kursk was. Independent. I was about to say, come on. (laughs) Maybe it is. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Well, uh, what what do you think happened to the Kursk? Uh, Maybe a freak chemical accident? Uh, This enemy forces attack scenario? I I don't know. What what do you guys think? I I, I do think the plausible thing is perhaps that uh, oops, followed by boom, boom. Uh, that's 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 me, but I don't know. Well, it, it, there's there's a great point brought up by some um, former CIA analysts and people familiar with the intelligence community. Uh, one guy in particular stood out to me, a guy named Jeffrey Edmonds, and he says, you know, something that's kind of tragic. He says there's simply a tendency for accidents to happen in Russia. And again, we're not being anti-Russian here. This is what this guy's saying. Uh, he's saying that. Russia appears to have this uh, process whereby they often combine a willingness to take risk with outdated infrastructure that just can't support that risk-taking culture, and that this creates an environment where accidents are more likely. This is a long-standing observation slash accusation of the Russian military, which is, you know, to put a fine point on it and to be brutally descriptive. Uh, they are, the military of Russia has been repeatedly accused of throwing bodies at a problem until they consider that problem solved. You know what I mean? That's why, that's why one of the most popular and even plausible theory, conspiracy theories in the world of space exploration isn't whether people went to the moon. It's how many cosmonauts might have died before Yuri Gagarin got into space and came back. Not to mention how many dogs died. <laughs> yeah, like that. Uh, and how guilty is any other country, and in, including and especially the United States, of, of course, that exact kind of, of thing. Even with course. the inflated budgets, and you know the 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 amount of importance that's placed on it culturally and publicly. Mm-hmm. No, no question about it. So let us know what you think happened. They're on August 10th, 2000, which it's crazy to realize that's almost two decades gone now. Uh, But we want to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. Uh, We always love to recommend for the uh, Facebook-friendly folks in the audience our community page. Here's where it gets crazy. Yeah, for all you FBFs out there. You can be our FBBFFs. Um, by joining, here's where it gets crazy. All you have to do is name one uh, or three or, you know, four, all four of us. Or just, you know, say something that lets us know that you're a real human being with actual interest in the topics that are discussed there, which range from specific things around our new episode drops to just really freewheeling conversation about anything and everything conspiracy realism related. If you don't want to do that or you want to do that and you want to do more, you can give us a call. Our number is... One eight three three S T D W Y T K. Lending toward the finish line. 
But I think well, it helped when you moved your hand. And yeah, no, you're, like the, you're the conductor, Matt. You are the conductor. Uh, yeah, you give us a call. Leave us a message. We will hear it. You might get on the air. Uh, as you know by now, we're making a lot more episodes that may include your voice. So send those things in. Tell us what you think. Uh, a lot of times, the, the more concise, the better. But it doesn't have to be. If you don't want to do any of that stuff but you still want to write to us, consider it your plan of action to send us an email to conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.